welcome you. Afternoon's event. Uh, please take a moment to turn off your cell phones and other electronic devices that may distract the proceedings today. Uh, my name is Randy Hall. I'm professor of art and chair of the Henry Edwards Distinguished Lectureship and Art Committee. And on behalf of the committee, I thank you for your attendance and trust you will enjoy our event, the 2016 Henry Edwards Distinguished Lectureship in Art. Before we begin this afternoon's presentation, I would like to take a moment to recognize just a few of the people who have helped make this year's lectureship a success. First, I'd like to recognize um, two of our uh, staff members, Catherine Thorson and Marla Daughtery, who work for us in the uh, Department of uh, Visual and Performing Arts, who helped organize this year's event. Second, I would like to recognize uh, Mr. Chris Stewart, who is the chair of the Department of Visual and Performing Arts. Uh, Dr. Carolyn Gascon, our new dean of the College of Arts and Humanities. Dr. Donald Topliff, the provost and vice president for academic affairs, and Dr. Brian May, president of Angelo State University. I want to thank them for their support. Third, I would like to recognize the lectureship committee itself, which is composed of uh, the ASU art faculty of Esteban Apodaca, uh, Dr. Devin Stewart, uh, Professor Edwin Quinco, Professor Ben Sam, and Professor John Van Cleric. I cannot thank those individuals enough because they are the ones who worked very diligently to make this lectureship an associated exhibition of reality. Uh, please join me in a round of applause for these individuals. Uh, now I'd like to uh, thank Mr. Joseph Henry Edwards and his wife Winona, who in 1992 established a trust fund specifically designated for the art program uh, within the Department of Visual and Performing Arts. Their trust provides funding for scholarships for outstanding art students, an artist residency, which we will implement next year, in today's lectureship in the arts. Without their kind and generous gift, we would not be here today to celebrate and learn more about the world of painting and the visual arts. So many thanks to the Edwards for their generosity and decision to support the visual arts at ASU. This year's lectureship is composed of three main events, an exhibition of our guest artist paintings, which has been on display in the ASU gallery for several weeks, and I might add, will end tomorrow. So if you haven't been over there, I highly suggest you get to the gallery. Uh, yesterday, we also had a gallery talk, and today we are involved in our lecture which at its conclusion will be followed by a reception out in the lobby and there will be some refreshments. I might add, after the lecture today, uh, immediately following, I think uh, Mr. Woodson will um, take questions and there's a microphone right here in the center if you want to ask questions um, after his lecture. It's now my honor and pleasure to introduce you to our distinguished artist and speaker for this year's lectureship. Jim Woodson is one of America's preeminent contemporary painters, a professor emeritus of art for Texas Christian University. Woodson was named Texas State Artist of the Year in 2013 by the Texas Commission on the Arts. His figure and landscape paintings, which have elements of realism, expressionism, surrealism, and even impressionism, have been displayed in more than 30 solo exhibitions and more than 50 group exhibitions from Dallas to New York, Santa Fe, New Mexico, to Florence, Italy. His works are a number of private and public permanent collections, including those of the San Angelo Museum of Fine Arts, the Amarillo Art Center, the El Paso Museum of Art, the Modern Art Museum of Fort Worth, and the San Antonio Museum of Art. A native of Waco, Woodson earned his Master of Fine Arts degree from the University of Texas at Austin and his Bachelor of Fine Arts from Texas Christian University in Fort Worth. 
His current exhibition in the ASU gallery displays a number of large-scale landscape paintings that juxtapose traditional images of the landscape with large areas of layered texture, color, and expressive brushstroke. The paintings are a feast for the eyes, a joy to the heart, and a challenge to the intellect. As works of art, they are objects that can be discussed, but cannot be explained away in words. They are doors that open to the vast regions of the imagination where the gifts of the soul and the spirit are brought to our awareness. Today, Mr. Woodson joins us as the 2016 Henry Edwards Lecturer in Art. He will discuss these paintings and others in a lecture titled About Time. Please help me welcome Mr. Jim Woodson. I'd like to thank everybody for being here, and I want to thank the uh, art program in the Department of uh, uh, Visual and Performing Arts here at Angelo State, and the uh, remarkable Edwards Lectureship in Art. You're very lucky to have such a thing um, here at, at Angelo State. Um, I decided that something that I thought might be a very interesting thing would be to do a kind of a mini retrospective of work that I that dates from about 1974 to the to the present, and uh, it's been it's sort of it's sort of my life, and I thought that might be of some interest to to a, a, an audience to see how an artist moves from one thing to another. Uh, for me, it was um, a very seamless um, transition, um, but if you look at things at the beginning and things now at the end, they're they're quite quite different. Um, I thought I would start with uh, some uh, drawings and paintings that I did just before I left California to come back to Texas. And I had a show at Shasta College in, uh, in Redding, California, and so I had to put together rather quickly this group of uh, drawings and, and paintings. And so it's the first, my, well, sort of my first uh, venture into um, uh, the, using a landscape as a uh, as a as part of what I did. Before that, I thought of myself as a kind of a figure painting painter, and um, so these are these are painting, paintings and drawings that represent that 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 time. Um, and the, the the attraction for me there was the the sort of Palomino colored hills of Northern California, which were um, very spare very, very few trees. They were mostly a kind of a, um, a, a, an image of dark and light, and they had beautiful color. But you can kind of see how, um, how, how empty of other content other than the forms themselves. This is a picture of my Fort Worth studio. I thought I would include some pictures of studios uh, that, I, that I'm currently working in. And uh, you can kind of see some large paintings that are sort of in the studio. This is, this is a, a current uh, view of the, of the studio. Um, when I got back uh, to Texas, there were no landscapes that looked like those California landscapes. And I started looking down at, um, at, the, at the local landscape and looking at places where Maybe perhaps a road was being cut through, or some object was mediating, in a sense, the uh, the landscape, and um, so everything became a kind of a close-up aspect of, of the landscape. And so I did a number of paintings that were like that, and then I moved to um, some some paintings that um, that I called "In Search of a New Unifying Myth." And I think at this time I was kind of influenced by uh, some earth artists like Robert Smithson and um, uh, Michael Heiser who were actually manipulating the earth uh, to, to create their work. And in this case, I only knew those, those people from reproductions in magazines and so, um, but I was, I was very interested in, in um, just that, the idea of, of the landscape as subject matter. Um, so I, I created this group of, of um, paintings that um, um, I thought about as 
Uh, by the way, this is a, a detail of the surface of the painting, because I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this in just a second. But uh, I thought about these as kind of having uh, like icon, iconic qualities to them, that they were somewhat ritualistic, perhaps, in, in nature. And um, I'm sorry the, uh, the title didn't come up on this one for some reason, um, but this one's called Desert Re Reservoir, and it's uh, about 40 by 50 inches. Um, one of the things that I was, uh, just before I left California, I was, I was doing a curatorial job and one of, the, one of the jobs was for me to oversee things that came off of, of a printing press and I got very, very interested in what those things look like as separate images. So I thought that would be perhaps something that I could use in these um, paintings. And so these were painted with acrylic paint on, um, on a white canvas, and they started off with a kind of a blue value study with a red color on top of that, a yellow color, color on top of that, and, a, and a, a little bit of black if one of those colors kind of got out of hand. So anything that's orange or purple or green are because of those overlayment of those, of those colors. And something else that I was very interested in was the way, um, um, it, 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 at least at this time, the way uh, colors came across on, on television. So the light seemed to come from behind. And uh, now, of course, we're looking at our cell phones all day and, and we have still have the same sort of thing. But at that time, we had no, uh, no cell phones. Um, uh, this is a, a painting that um, was called O Monument. O Monument and it's uh, in the collection of the San Antonio Museum of Art. And the idea here was to build a structure. I might say that what I did with, with all of the paintings you've just been looking at is I would construct, them, construct a piece of sculpture, in effect, and put it in a landscape and then photograph that landscape and then use the photograph to produce the painting. And um, this one was called the O Monument and it was a kind of a half circle built and there, it was completed by its reflection in the, in the water. And I did a number of paintings that were about um, a kind of um, a history of the O Monument. So there, was, there were images of the O Monument being uncovered um, and uh, wrapped in different ways and stuff. By the way, this image was um, completely, it was a kind of a V-shaped uh, shaft that was buried completely. So all you saw was the opening of the, of the shaft. And then I used a piece of rope to draw, to draw that shape uh, above the, um, above the um, uh, uh, ground. Then I did a series of, um, of uh, paintings that I call shadow markers. And um, in and, and this image, these were done on, on pieces of, of uh, cardboard. And so, um, you know, every every day or every few hours or whatever it was was going on, you know, I would um, um, be get to be one of my favorite painters. And so, in this case, I actually included myself in the very first one. But there's a Vermeer, a De Kooning, uh, a, a Jasper Johns, a Picasso, and a, and a Ra um, Rosenquist in this case. Anyway, I, I put these out in the field, photographed them, and then interpreted them. Um, um, with with um, paint, and uh, I've forgotten. This is in an oil company's collection, but I've forgotten which which one it is. But it's another uh, sort of the same along the same idea, and I especially liked being uh, Vermeer for a day. That was always a, a great challenge, and uh, the initial one was more Vermeer-like. As they got reinterpreted and up through through the whole process, they got a little bit looser. I did a series then um, after that that um, that I called geometric landscapes, and um, they were simply, a, in a way, a kind of an extension of those first uh, paintings, except that I didn't actually build anything. I sort of imposed these geometric forms on the landscape and then painted the landscape around them. The landscape at this at this point was still a pretty generic landscape. You know, it, it didn't have very much specificity other than than um, you know what you could see. 
And this was probably the culminating part of of, um, of that series, uh, and a little bit of a venture into sculpture. Um, the um, the painting is composed of uh, a, a large painting that's I, I don't know about. Uh, I guess it's off the ground, it's probably about eight or nine feet off the ground. And then there's a triangle laying in front of that that, that sort of would stand up about, about so high if you saw the, you know, if you saw it stood up. Then there's a sort of a, this is another part of the geometric series, but, um, and this front piece that goes, that you can see in the front, it's painted illusionistically on one side, so if you were to move to the left on this painting, it would disappear into the landscape. If you move to the right, it would become another one of those uh, geometric uh, forms there. And there's a part there that on the right-hand side um, that also is, there's, there's a hinged piece there that's painted illusionistically and and geometric uh, flat painting too. It sort of hangs, moves away from the surface of the painting. Um, another one, a series that I did that um, that were basically done on on paper, and they went into a corner. And so with the orange stripe that's actually painted on the paper is actually is actually painted on the paper. And the other piece, piece uh, that goes up and across the corner, you can sort of see the shadow uh, there that kind of gives you a little bit of a sense of what, uh, what that looked like. Then I did a series of, of, um, of paintings that had the title Li, uh, which is a, uh, a Chinese term, and I'm going to read the, the definition because I can't, I can't um, quite get, get this um, without doing that. Uh, the term mean, signifies a principle or law to which parts of wholes have to conform by, by virtue of their existence as parts of a, of, of, of a whole, of wholes, and must fit precisely into place with the other parts to create the whole. So I thought that was a very interesting uh, notion. And so, in a sense, I, I began to use these architectural and geometric forms uh, kind of um, imposed on on a landscape, and in some cases, the the geometrical or architectural forms would appear to jut, jut off of the surface, and in some cases, the the landscape itself would 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 uh, have more of that kind of form. So I did quite a few of these. Um, I think I only sold one one of these paintings, and it was it. it it was all put together as a very, very large, large piece, and this was the largest piece that I did in that in that series. And um, but anyway, you can kind of see uh, what I'm talking about with the landscape seeming appearing to, to come forward sometimes and then and then receding. So it was just being playful with with what one could do with with space. But you can see the plugs at the bottom that gives you some sort of a sense of the of the size and scale of it. Then I did a series that, that I roughly called shelters, vaults, chambers, sanctuaries, and passages. And most of these were uh, fairly small uh, paintings, also with the generic landscapes. And um, I wanted to kind of give a sense of these as, as having some kind of iconic uh, power to them. And I don't know whether you can really see this or not, but see, I, I have a laser pointer. There's a thing, can you see that form right there? Anyway, there was something um, that I came across that um, of, of atomic reactions and bubble chambers, and, and I thought, well, that stuff is going on all the time. And so I thought I'll just put put these in a series of paintings. So there are in a, a number of these paintings. I, I forget if they're there sometimes, but but um, but anyway, I thought this is going on unseen all the time for us. And so I thought, well, I'll put put some of those things in in a painting. Once again, it, there's one of those to to, to the to the right of of, um, of that opening.
and I think I did a series of, of these. This is still part of that same series, but um, driving through Europe, uh, you would come upon, when there was a tunnel, you would come upon this, this image of what a tunnel looked like. And I thought there was something very interesting about that. And I thought the idea that one, if one came out of the tunnel in a different place, a different shape, uh, something that literally couldn't be done, I, I, I don't think. Anyway, I, I've actually toyed with the idea of trying to build one of these things. But uh, I did a number of pieces that would have a different exit, uh, if you will, on, on, the, uh, on the back side of the, of the tunnel. Um, I think at some point um, I wanted to um, be able to have different kinds of imagery uh, within the landscape. So I started using uh, some uh, architectural um, forms, uh, some figurative forms, um, some things that communicated activity, but without, without being um, too specific about it. Uh, so I did a series of, of mostly small paintings um, uh, that in a, in a way have still informed some of the, 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 the paintings that I'm working on now. And I think, uh, uh, but once again, I'm back to kind of generic landscape. At some point, somebody said to me, um, if you're going to be a landscape painter, why not paint the landscapes that you, you really love? And so I kind of became, moved into a place where I started painting more specific uh, landscapes. Um, some of these are local Texas landscapes and some are not. But I, I think at this point, um, I was kind of moving into a, a, a kind of a, a, a dark place. And I began to think about um, images as, um, juxtaposing images of the landscape against um, um, these darker these darker sections. In these darker sections, anything could be going on. So I, I began to think of them as, as a kind of a, 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 the dark theater of the soul. The landscape went outside, and then this other created a kind of a, a more close up in, inside. And so I did, I did a number of these. Almost all of these were uh, works on paper. And I went through these very, very quickly. But I like the activity of, of the paint. And even in the most recent paintings, uh, you can see some aspect of this even in those paintings, although most of the time they get, they get uh, covered up. I'm sorry I didn't put titles on these. I, you know, I looked back and some of them I hadn't even signed. And uh, you know, it's like, I think it's unforgivable of an artist not to sign, <laughs> sign their work. You know, you're, if you're a viewer, you're entitled to a title. Um, these, these began to change into um, um, a different kind of space. And uh, in this case, uh, that's, a, that's a ghost ranch uh, landscape back there. And um, I created a kind of a, a space that was a kind of an interior space that I thought of this kind of an interior space. But I began to use this uh, broken chair that I moved from California, thinking that that would be a, uh, a good studio chair if it were ever repaired. And I like the idea of it because you could tell the, you could tell the slope of, the, of that space by, by the, where the chair's legs were and what how much of a seat that you could see. I liked it as a metaphorical kind of idea because it, 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 you knew the size of it relative to your body. A chair invites you in to sit down, but it's a broken chair, so it would pinch your butt if you did sit in it. So anyway, I used this in, a, in, in quite a few uh, uh, paintings, but I did a number of paintings, and this is when I really started um, utilizing uh, the high desert landscapes. And I wanted to communicate in this, in this foreground part that there was an activity going on. You didn't know exactly what it was going on, maybe a kind of a ritualistic activity. So if I used something that looked like figures, you couldn't tell exactly what kind of activity they were engaged in, and um, thus and so. Um, this was a... a um, a landscape that was uh, near Fort Davis, Texas. Um, 
place that uh, my wife and I almost bought some property there because we loved it so much there. And um, and this is a painting that I have still hanging in my, my house in Fort Worth. This was the largest in the series of, uh, of these, these paintings, and this was, and, and a number of these paintings were in the uh, Modern Art Museum, in, in an exhibition in the Modern Art Museum uh, at a time when I had been doing the, uh, uh, a collaboration with the Fort Worth Opera on, the, on, on Carmen. And um, being a kind of a collaboration meant that these, that Carmen was going to sort of take place in my in my paintings, and the, uh, the 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 scenic artists that were assigned to work with me uh, didn't quite grasp that that uh, that notion, and so they began to interpret my work, and it had had nothing at all to do with the painting. So I ended up doing. 50-foot-long paintings with a, an ex-student of mine who was also a scenic artist as well. And so for the first time, I got to make really, really big, big paintings. But this, this was an exhibition that uh, accompanied the, the opera during the time it was running. Uh, then I did a series of um, paintings that, um, that I call the bifurcation uh, paintings. And most of them uh, utilize the landscapes uh, of the Big Bend. And in this case, um, these dark stripes that you see running uh, uh, vertically across the, the, uh, the painting, uh, I thought about those as breaks in, in, conscious, uh, in, in consciousness. And I began to think about, well, what, how does one understand that one is conscious and I thought one understands it because there are, there are times when you when you you're con if your consciousness is not exactly there at least it's 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 altered in a way and um, so I thought about these black stripes as, as kind of uh, breaks in the landscape the way a doorway is a break in in a wall and so I thought about them as sort of something that you passed through back into a different kind of space and I think I started, you know, I started playing a little bit with spatial kinds of things. The, the landscape uh, moved back uh, in space, and the, and the marks in those dark areas, um, I, I attempted to try to, to make, create a kind of a bulge. If you read the, the marks across, you maybe you would have a sense that they, things were kind of bulging towards you. Um, let's see what else I want to say about that. Um, I'll show you several more of these. Uh, I also wanted to show you a few um, a few uh, details of some of these paintings because one, one of the things that I want you to, to do, if you get to visit my show, I hope that you'll go up and look at the surface of the paintings because I want them to be understood one way from a distance and another way when you, when you look at them up close. And something that I learned from the scenic artist um, that I worked with is they said, well, if you want your, 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 your sets to be understood from a distance, then you need to spray dots on them because that gives them, the, the dots kind of catch the light. And so um, I thought about, well, what if I did the dot patterns first? And so I sprayed on with, with these garden sprayers, you know, the th kind you pump up and you have a wand and you spray on dots. And so I sprayed on blue dots, red dots, and yellow dots on, on the painting before I started to, to work on it. And um, if I go back, if you look at, um, let's see, that part of the painting right there, um, that's, that's where this is. So you can see there was a certain uh, economical advantage to, to, to doing this because I could get away with making just a few marks and you believe that there was a, a kind of a bush there. But, but basically it was just, you know, just, and I don't know whether, um, I don't know whether you can actually see it, but if you look, if you could see the painting all up in here, you do see the, the, the dots kind of coming through that. Anyway, every once in a while, I'll, call, I'll come back and do some things uh, like that again, because it's sort of a prepared canvas that, that uh, um, I, I don't know, it's, it's, it's one of those kind of things that it, to see how much you can get away with and still have a viewer uh, buy, buy it. Um, 
This is a, a place outside of the Big Bend along the river road. And um, you couldn't actually see this unless you could make your eyes move off in two different directions. So uh, I photographed it that way. And, um, and uh, that's the Rio Grande with Mexico on the, on the other side. Uh, another uh, Big Bend landscape um, with St. Elena Canyon sort of right in the middle of the, of the canvas. This is another version of, of that other painting. And uh, I began to think about what happens if you think across an image. I mean, if you, if you move your head from, from one side to the other. So I hope that's it's not a very good image. I'm sorry about that. Um, but if you look at the center part of the image, um, it's mostly just about a kind of an activity there. You know, you, you sort of, the, the image is kind of clarified on the, on the, on the outside image. And I, I apologize for the quality of that slide. Um, this is the house that, that Barbara and I built in, in uh, near Abiquiu, New Mexico. And the studio is on the, the left-hand side. And the mountain you see in the background is Cerro Pedernal that Georgia O'Keeffe painted so many times. And she's, that's the mountain that um, she said if she painted it enough, God would give it to her. Well, God gave, is giving it to me now, so, because uh, uh, I painted a lot of times. Um, the house is in the center, and there's a, a, a little uh, garage casita on the, on the, on the right-hand side. This is what we look at when we look at our front window. This is Ghost Ranch, uh, where George O'Keefe's studio would have been um, approximately right in there. And that part of, um, is, that part's still closed to visitors. I'm hoping at some, some point that they'll open it. Um, but there's a lake there now, and um, the Ghost Ranch property comes right up to the the edge of our property, just just below these trees right here, because it was there before the lake, before the lake was there. This is a little closer view of the studio. Look inside. Another look inside. This is the way it looked when we left the other day. Um, this, I think, um, represents more uh, of, of what my paintings uh, look like now. Um, and I think um, this is where I really wanted to communicate something that, that was in that first, that first um, um, thing. I'm just going to read that to you since I don't have it. Um, Memory images serve to identify, interpret, and supplement perception. No neat borderline separates a purely perceptual image from one, if such there is, from one completed by memory. And that's a quote uh, by Rudolf Arnheim. And it seemed particularly appropriate to me because I think, you know, when you're in, when you're in a landscape or anywhere as far as that's, that's concerned, your inner world is always commenting on what the outer world is. So there's a sense of, of this voice going on in your head and it's always telling you, you something. It brings up memories, it brings up fantasies or, or, or whatever. So I thought in, in order to make a complete landscape, I would try or make an attempt to try to bring those two things together, the inner world and the, and the outer world. So in essence, that's kind of what all, all the rest of these paintings uh, are about. Um, one thing that I might, I might mention, um, we were drawn to this part of the world uh, at one time when, when my wife Barbara was uh, attending a, a Jungian conference at Ghost Ranch. And I had, uh, I had a little motorcycle and I would put my painting stuff on the back and I would go out and do plain air painting while she was in, in session. And we really fell in love with the, with the area. And every time we'd go back to New Mexico, we would, we would, uh, we would go there. And then at one point we found, obviously found a place to build a house. Um, uh, oh, but the, uh, something else that, that um, Barbara has a, um, 
a meditation group that's called Time Space Knowledge, and it's based on the work of Tharthang, Tharthang Tulku. And um, I realized that some of the titles that I were, was using were, were sort of based upon time words, space words, and, and knowledge words. And so when you look at the titles of these paintings, um, that's kind of where they come from. Uh, at, at, at some point after I've painted a, a bunch of paintings, I'll, I'll get out a dictionary and I'll look for time words, space words, and knowledge words. And so they're usually some combination of, of uh, those things. And it's just become part of these things. Now, I never remember, uh, I'm sorry, this is, this is a kind of a throwback to, to um, um, this doesn't have those those uh, um, titles, but um, I kind of show this piece in a way. Um, this is a piece that Burlington Northern Railroad, who have been very very generous with collecting my work, uh, but this was done in uh, 1993, and this is from a place called Chimney Rock at Ghost Ranch, and you're looking back at Cerro Pedernal and our property is somewhere right in here. So it was almost like predestined that we would eventually uh, end up here. Another New Mexico landscape. And you can sort of see in this painting um, um, some of the things that, that are in the, in the earlier, uh, or in the later paintings that have to do with um, uh, some kind of activity going on, some sort of inner world uh, interference or something going on in, uh, you know, in, in, uh, within the, the landscape, but somewhat kind of buried in there. This one's a kind of a maximal amount of painting, I mean, it's because it has just about equal amount of, of, um, of the, the intrusions on the landscape as it does the landscape itself. This is a painting that's in the, the in the exhibition, um, and I think how are we doing on time? Um, um, one uh, something that I noticed uh, in my studio, uh, I had some skylights, and and uh, certain times of the day uh, I would close the skylights because of the interference of the sun, but there were little cracks around the edges of the of the, of the skylight. And so light would move across the painting uh, from, from left to right. And um, I hope that's right. And um, I began to think about it as a, um, as a commentary about time. And that's something I'm very, very, very interested in. That I'll talk just a little bit about that in a minute. But I started including some memory of that in, in these paintings. Of course, it wouldn't look like this exactly because th they wouldn't be they wouldn't be bent. I sometimes made them conform a little bit to the landscape itself, uh, so they became slightly more dimensional in some cases. Um, but anyway, uh, you can see an example of that. It appears in, in a lot of other paintings, but perhaps a little bit more um, subtly. I think I might mention something about about time because that's the name of this this lecture, and I think um, there are two things that, about time for me. There's there's a sense of duration, and this landscape seems to communicate a sense of duration, like it's always been like that. And you, you know, you go out every day; it's always it's always there. It feels like it's always going to be there. Intellectually, we know that's not true, but but it, that's that's the sense that it get that you get. And I think about these other parts as a kind of a, a stream of consciousness. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. But but um, the um, that that aspect of the paintings were about another aspect of time, which is tempo, which is a musical term, but it it played out um, in in my mind um, as something that happens in the present. The difference between thinking and thought these are, these ideas are tied up together, so I don't know, don't know how to quite tease them apart, but. But uh, I thought about time as having, um, I mean, I thought about thinking versus thought 
and thought is something that's complete and thinking is something that's alive in the moment so I wanted the part that's about tempo in these paintings to be about that thinking that happens at the end of the brush not necessarily with your mind which which you know if you have it in your mind you have the image in your mind you put it down you're putting it down from thought I wanted to get to communicate the idea that you were that you were thinking at the end of that brush in that moment. So all the rest of the paintings that you'll see have that aspect to them. Um, I think I think I found myself pretty much at the end of the of, of, of the, um, the things that I wanted to, to get across. So I'm going to show you some of these images and uh, if something comes into my mind about that I can say about them, I will. But uh, I, I want you to keep in mind the idea about thinking and thought and duration and tempo. I guess one other thing I can, I can say about, about these paintings is that um, they're some, to some degree about chaos and order. And if you've seen the show, you realize that I push the the more realistic aspect of the of the of the landscape to the top um, uh, part of the of, of the picture plane, and so that gives me a lot more room in the on the lower part to to, to be playful to to uh, create whatever I can get away with down there. But mostly they move from a ser from chaos at the bottom. Uh, to more order at the top, or if you're looking from the top down, you move into a kind of entropic uh, thing where things begin to kind of uh, break apart. And um, there is one painting in the uh, the exhibition that has has a self-portrait as part of the title, and a lot of times it takes people a while to figure out where the self-portrait. Um, part of this is, but it's this. Uh, that's my walking stick, and these are these are my toes. And I did that sort of out of desperation. I was I was kind of at a place where the paintings I felt like they needed something, and so just as a kind of a I don't know crazy idea, I thought, I'll just paint my my toes in the bottom of the, of the picture plane. And then after thinking about it a while, I thought, well, this is kind of interesting because in order to look at your toes, you have to look down. It causes you to look down, and then you begin to look back up at the, uh, at the landscape. So I thought it did, it sort of served its purpose. And I, I did quite a few uh, paintings with my, with my toes, and there's another one with, with, with actually with my shoes and knees in it too. But. I think in some cases, um, a, a, a lot of these paintings had a lot of drawing in them, and I think in, in a number of cases, I moved away a bit from the drawing aspect of it to uh, swatches of, of, of color. This is the uh, painting that the Modern Art Museum of Fort Worth bought a few years ago, and I think it's really a, a, a wonderful painting. It's one of my favorite paintings. Um, a friend of mine, came to see me and he said, I saw your painting at the Modern and I saw the hand in the painting. And I thought, I don't know what you're talking about, you know. So I went back and and sure enough, whoop, I'm sorry, 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 sorry. Right there, there's his hand. I hope, I guess you can see it. Um, anyway, when I see the painting now, that's all I can see. And I'd love to just slip back into the museum sometime and get rid of that hand, just obfuscate it a little bit at least. A lot of times there will be a kind of uh, vertical activity going on in the paintings, um, especially the ones that are, are more uh, horizontal. This is... Um, the landscape here is generated from um, the Chama River, and this is actually a, a takeout where they were raft 
raptors come to take take it out. And I included it. Uh, it's a it's an it's a painting on panel, and I don't know why there's no title there. Some, for some reason, some in this transition, I, some of the titles got lost. But um, I wanted to include this because I wanted to give uh, a, an indication of what the surface looks like up close. Uh, this is um, two years ago. The city of Fort Worth um, bought this painting. And this was the first time they bought uh, a painting uh, for the city's collection. And um, they bought some outdoor sculptures and that sort of thing. But this is the first time they bought a painting. And um, they had a committee that, that thought this was the, the painting that the city would like. I actually had some Fort, a Fort Worth painting that I thought that they would buy because it had Fort Worth landscape. But they, they really like this one. And I think this is really an excellent painting. I wish the, I wish the uh, um, slide communicated more of it. But this is part of what a close-up of the surface of the painting. This is exaggerated uh, a, a bit large, but you can see kind of how um, the activity of the paint is, plays a major role in, in what the painting looks like. This is another, another uh, detail. They had an exhibition of that painting to introduce it to the to the city and um, at the Community Arts Center in Fort Worth. And I painted several other paintings. Uh, I think there were four paintings all together. Each one had its own little alcove to to exist in. And these were paintings that kind of followed up on that. And you can kind of see these um, these stripes. Of course, they would never do that in real life because those are those are opposing uh, opposing uh, stripes. But that once again a time time reference. It's a painting that's currently in my studio in Fort Worth. This was a, a painting that was commissioned. Um, there's a there's a ranch in, in Fort Worth that's been that, that's been there for a long time. Fort Worth has built up around it, and it's the Edwards Ranch, which is a two Edwards now thing in, in my my uh, uh, recent past. Um, but they were opening a, a, a building. It's a kind of a business park uh, with apar apartments and that sort of thing. Um, they got the, the land got to be so valuable that they couldn't keep keep it as a ranch. So it's a current development there. And they wanted to commission a, a painting for um, uh, for their 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 building. And so um, I went out to West Texas, where near Tahoka. I probably know what Tahoka might be. Um, because they wanted their landscape to be generated from from there. And so for two days, the foreman of the ranch drove me around looking at landscapes that I might be able to use, and it was very, very flat there. And I thought, this is not going to work for me because my, my work is about having something in the background that, that has some verticality to it. Um, anyway, they finally came to a place where there's an old earthen dam that had washed out and and uh, it had gone back down the hill and left a little pond in front. And I thought that's something that I can I can work with. So this painting is 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 ten feet tall, and I had to um, put rollers on the table and roll it over and so I could get on top of it. And I still had to reach way up to paint the top of it. But it was just great fun, and um, and I was really really pleased with the with the way it came out. This is um, some details of what some of the surface looks like. Then I'm going to show you a few things that I have been working on currently, and. Um, I had so many big paintings in the studio, I thought maybe I should make some small paintings. I've always struggled making small paintings. And so I, I bought some canvases, like this is 24 by 24. And as a kind of a, um, um, I don't know what you call it, uh, 
a, a, a way of kind of challenging myself, I took a palette knife and I put that big yellow stripe right across the middle of it. And I thought, now, paint your way out of that. And so uh, I began to um, um, put on more paint like that, and then I began to draw back into that, that paint. And this is while, um, while I was doing that, I was also painting the, the landscape part of it. But it had, they, they had a lot of energy to them, and you couldn't quite resolve the, um, the, the paint marks. And in some cases, like, like um, where the, this part, almost kind of makes a transition back in, into the, that landscape. So I started trying to look for ways of transitioning back to the landscape. So here's a, here's a series of, of these small paintings. Then I did a really big one. So this is 84 inches by, by 6 inches. A slightly different quality to it, but um, it still had some of the uh, that same kind of um, very, very strongly painted passages, and then the landscape kind of painted around them. But I found some of the interesting things apart about it was like when those things sur sort of surrounded uh, an area, that area tended to kind of bulge out. Some, sometimes the, the heavily di painted areas came forward, sometimes other parts of it came forward. So I, I thought there was something really interesting about playing with that, that idea. And uh, I thank you for welcoming me here. Everybody's been really, very nice to me. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm glad to have made this connection and, and uh, uh, see what a, a nice school this is and, um, and to get acquainted a little bit with, with San Angelo. So thank you.